All right, everybody, welcome back to Slept on Sports, the podcast where we share interesting, lesser known sports stories, stories you could say have been slept on. I am Connor Grawl, as always, and today I am joined by Mike Tyrell. Hello, I'm back. And Jake Bermonde. Great to be here. Yeah, how are you guys doing? Not bad. It's a Friday. It's windy, it's cold. It's going to be a lot more of that coming up, I feel like, in the next few months. Yeah, well, you told me yesterday that you uh, never wore a coat in the last couple of years, so good luck with that. This is what happens when you live in Houston, Texas, and do undergrad in Austin, Texas. Very rarely is there coat weather. The wind, the wind here is just brutal. Like, I, I mean, I've, I've dealt with cold winters. I was in Denver for the last four years or so, and uh, it's just a different kind of cold here with the wind. Yeah, next to that lake, it's just... Well, right, that's what I feel like, because I feel like I've been in you know 30 40 degrees and it's not that bad but like when it's here with the wind it's like almost unbearable yeah the wind's (laughs) the killer all right so of course today as always on the show we're talking about slept on sports stories lesser known sports stories jake since this is your first time you want to get us going sure um well first of all thanks for having me on um as i was kind of doing research and trying to figure out all right what is a story that i think needs to be talked about more um, immediately I went to soccer, grew up playing soccer, love soccer, love watching the premier league, um, love the U S men's national team. Um, but I'm going to talk about major league soccer and their struggles with expanding. So, uh, without further ado, uh, soccer, just like starting wars in great recession, soccer is another thing that women have a better track record at in this country. And <laughs> the struggles of the men's national team have been well-documented. But the MLS and their expansion strategy, however, has not. And the, the business strategy, this expansion strategy of Major League Soccer has been slept on. So um, as, as part of the agreement to award the 1994 host country to uh, United States for the World Cup, FIFA was like, hey, you, you got to have at least a professional soccer league here. I mean, come on, like, what are you guys doing? And so... You know, flashback to 1996, I was three, so I really don't know much about it. Um, Clinton was president. That was cool. Uh, in Independence Day, that was a cool movie. That's pretty much all I know about 1996. But also, the Major League Soccer was launched. So it, it launched in 1996. It had 10 teams, and it was, it was faced with this, like, seemingly impossible task, right? Like, how do you grow soccer in a country that loves football, loves baseball, has basketball growing faster than ever. I mean, this is in the middle of, of Jordan's Bulls. And as a business, you know, MLS is going to find out is not going to be easy to expand and grow and compete in this competitive sports world. And so this is how you start a professional sports league based off of my limited research. Uh, and while I guess this is really how you start anything, really, uh, the first step is you have to launch. So hopefully you guys are with me here. And then the second step is you have to grow. So like, boom, that's it. You just start and then you grow. That's it. It's so easy. Yeah. It's just so two steps. <laughs> it's, just, it's just really easy. Two steps. You launch and then you grow. Um, and so 1996, they, they launched. They had, you know, very standard cities to launch from. Kansas City, L.A., Denver, Boston, et cetera. And, and in 1996, those cities collectively sailed away on the USS soccer and away they went. And then step two, as I explained in this, you know, Michael Scott explained it to me like on five strategy of just how you start anything. The grow is where the struggle was. And this is what I want to, you know, really get into the meat and potatoes here. Let's analyze MLS's growth. What's been their strategy? How's it going? And what does that mean for the future of men's soccer in America? Yeah, and, this is a good thing to talk about because I think just from an outsider's perspective, I don't know exactly all the strategy that you're going to get into, but it seems to me like just every year or two, like they just add like a new team randomly. And it is, it's a little confusing because, you know, most of these leagues uh, around the world are, you know, 18 teams, 20 teams. The MLS is like, you know, going to be pushing 30 soon. Or soon yeah. And, you know, there's, you know, there's not like a, promotion relegation system and I don't think there's currently plans for one uh so yeah I'm kind of interested to hear about you know what they're kind of thinking about with this plan yeah and there's there's no way to squeeze in this fact here like smoothly at all and so like just to take the train off course for a little bit um but I'll I'll bring it back did you guys know that in the first three seasons of MLS in the 90s they tried to like Americanize the sport of soccer and so 
when the clock hit zero, it was like a buzzer in, in, in hockey or, or basketball. Like, it was over. Like, that was it. Like, once a buzzer hit, the, the game ended. And then the one that was nuts to me is if the game ended in a tie, it wasn't like, all right, you get one point, the other team gets one point. It was, all right, we're going right to penalty shootouts to determine a winner. Did you guys know that? That's pretty crazy. Yeah, I think I was – and they have – and it wasn't even just like a traditional penalty shootout either where it's, you know, it just – you had like a run up part of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Really you started. You started from like the, the the halfway line, and you just started running at the other goalie. Like that's insane. And yeah, you could see footage of that, and that's just hilarious. <laughs> it is hilarious. Well, I still think even like I mean, obviously it's tougher, but like at high school level too, um, they still like the concept of uh, added time. You know, is not really a thing right now. Like you see, you see teams. The clock is coming down, and they're trying to quickly kick the corner. And I'm like, that's not how it's supposed to be done. You should have time. Like you know, this is but that's that's what it is. You know, it was a sport that people didn't really yeah, know what I, the hell they were doing. And I and I I think if we were trying to gain legitimacy as like, look, America's playing soccer now. The way to do it is not by these like absurd penalty shootouts. But well, no, but I mean that's also the struggle they had, right? I mean, from like you know our generation, I I think we we you know grew up from you know enjoying soccer and just for context for those listening I mean all all three of us here are in our 20s but like from a you know our parents generation I don't even think they really you know watched any soccer at all unless it was you know this crazy you know bicycle kick goal highlight every once in a while but it wasn't like they were you know seeing soccer live on tv like it is today um so yeah yeah, and that's it's interesting because you know my my you know my dad for example huge sports fan, but every time he sees me watching soccer, which usually is you know every weekend, he'll be like, oh, what's the game zero zero? What's the end in the tie? What's the end in the tie? I'm like, no, like that's a very <laughs> unlikely outcome, especially now. So it's just kind of funny how like the old school, um, you know, people in this country, especially, they don't really know the game and they just kind of assume the basic stereotypes, which are not very true. Well, and that's where the struggle was, right? I mean, MLS was launched in 96. They're going, you know, that's that's the market they have to break into. How, how do you get, you know, Mike's dad to, to pay attention to soccer at all? And, and from an expansion standpoint, they quickly realized that from a TV perspective, we're struggling, so let's just expand city-wise. And, and so kind of getting this train back on course here. So – what, what MLS did was they, they looked at this competitive market, and for the first 11 years, they just tried to hang on for dear life, right? They had two teams that left the, the entire organization, the Tampa Bay Mutiny and the Miami Fusion. They are just like, hey, we're out of here. And then they added six teams, which was good. So they had Chicago, Chivas, we all say out Lake, Houston Dynamo, and, and Toronto joined. And then in 2009, the league just went bananas. And by, by I mean bananas, from 2009 to 2020, Major League Soccer went from 14 teams to 26. And by 2023, the, the league will be up to 30. I mean, that is just absolutely insane. And, and, and I know Connor just mentioned at the beginning, but the, the fact that they, from 2009 to 2023, are going to go from 14 teams to 30 uh, is just astounding. And when you look at that at first glance, you go, oh, so that's good. MLS is growing. MLS is healthy. And they're doing, you know, great things. They're expanding. Soccer's growing in America. But when you actually look at their financials, a completely different picture comes up. And when you, you really have to look at the, the TV growth, where from a TV perspective, this is where the story slept on. They, they, grew, they grew like bananas in terms of city, but economically, the growth has been just garbage. I mean, they're trying to look at, you know, expansion in terms of, oh, well, if we have 30 teams, we must be healthy. But TV media rights fuel sports worldwide. It's not about ticket sales. It's not about the number of teams you have. It's not about an expansion fee that gets paid to owners. It's about TV growth. And because of that, so there's, in 2018, out of the 25 teams in the league at the time, how many do you think were profitable? I mean, not, not probably not a lot, right? Probably, I don't know, five. Yeah, seven. Seven MLS teams were profitable in 2018. So the majority of the clubs are losing money. Uh, and some of them are losing money now, and they've been losing money for 25 years. I mean, that's that's not really a business at that point. If you're if, if 25 years in, you're losing. And that's where the story is insane to me because, you know, 
I think when you look at MLS and, and look at soccer and men's soccer in specific in America, you think it's going great. But from a TV perspective, MLS as a whole gets $90 million total from ESPN to broadcast their games. That's around $3 million per team. And just for some quick comparison, each NFL team gets $255 million a year in TV rights. Each NBA team around $100 million. And MLO varies because of local rights, but the median is about $140 million. So you're, you're comparing 255 100 140 to 3 really? And I know it's, it's tough to compare MLS to – you know, the three most popular and profitable sports league in the entire world. But I mean, that's, you know, frankly, what they're competing against in America. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. It's so tough for me when I'm looking at this. Cause I think, yeah, when I think of the expansion for the MLS, I feel like that would be kind of diluting the talent pool. So the matches wouldn't actually be competitive and the league wouldn't be as strong. And yet they're still, thinking about it in this very American context of like bigger is better, more is better. And if we have the most teams, then we're must be doing so well, but it's very strange to me because at some point that model will just kind of collapse, right? If they don't start doing better in terms of, you know, ratings and generating TV revenue. And I don't necessarily think that adding more teams will add to their media rights values unless more people are interested. What it seems like it would be doing would just be reducing the amount that goes to each individual club. Well, and that's where, from a long-term perspective, that's what they're hedging their bets on. They're saying, you know, for the next 25 years, we need to have these young, enthusiastic fans, which, you know, has, has worked. Like the Pacific Northwest is a really good example of how, you know, Portland didn't have a team, Seattle didn't have a team, Vancouver didn't have a team. And now all three of those cities have like this, this avid fan base where they're selling out their stadiums and, you know, they're, they're growing their fan base, which will grow TV viewership, which will grow TV, you know, dollars. But, you know, it's, it's something that, that can't just work regionally, you you know, to grow the entire league, you have to, you know, expand everywhere. And in 2022, the league's going to be renegotiating their media deals and, to be, to be frank, if they want to have another 25 years, they're going to have to score big. Like they, they're, they're going to have to change this, this media TV rights because right now it's just not sustainable. And it's almost insane to think that, you know, America can't have a professional soccer league, but it's been 25 years. The majority of the teams are, are not profitable. And if that doesn't change in the next 25, it's just not going to happen. So I, have a, I mean, yeah, and it, it definitely makes sense. I'm just, I have a very, I believe that I think actually I like the expansion idea. Um, more cities, more opportunity. I know what you're saying about, you know, the, what, you know, the profitability and everything, but you look at some teams like Atlanta United, right? That is a great case of a team that, they, I mean, they could sit for playoff games. I think they they had the MLS Cup there one year. I mean, we're talking about 70,000 people there. Like that's a perfect place. That stadium, that city, that diversity, LAFC as well recently gets their game sold out. They're a very good team. These are two new teams. I think Inter-Miami, you know, once we get fans there, is going to be very uh, important as well. So, you know, we're talking about Austin in a couple of years from now or maybe next year. Yep. Um, we'll see about St. Louis. We'll see about Charlotte. We'll see about Sacramento. Uh, and I understand, like, growing the brand throughout. But I think it's interesting because you talked about how the MLS was created on the basis of the World Cup in 94. Well, in 2026 – the U.S. is hosting the World Cup with Mexico, with Canada. And I think that is just a massive opportunity there. And I've said this for a few years now. I really believe, and maybe this is just my desire because, you know, I'm like you, Jake, big soccer fan. But uh, I hope that, you know, 30 years from now, maybe, soccer in the United States is going to reach incredible heights. And I think that there's an op- opportunity for that to happen. I think this World Cup in a few years from now is going to be huge. You look at some of the best players on the American team – they're in Europe right now. They're playing at the highest leagues. You know, we have Pulisic, but you have a lot of other great players. McKinney, you have Adams, you have uh, you have Reina, Gio Reina playing for Dortmund, one of yes. the best you know, clubs in the world. So we're talking about some of the best players on the national team that are playing at the highest level in some of these incredible teams. And I think that a young core, a young, exciting core of players, plus the growth of this, of more places in the MLS – Um, If they can figure out that TV deal, if they can become more profitable, if you have more Atlanta Uniteds, if you have more LAFCs, and this team goes on a run, 
you know, they have to qualify in two years from now. They have to go to the, to the World Cup in 2022. That's a must. Learn from that. Get experience there. And then in 2026, I mean, I really think that this is a great moment for soccer in the United States for men and obviously with the women's team continuing to be the best in the world. So I'm very optimistic, but you're right. They need to figure out, you know, where they go from here and have a coherent plan because the MLS is known as being a very chaotic league in all, in all facets. From yeah, I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm so optimistic on, on men's soccer in, in America as a whole. It's just from an expansion strategy, you know, perspective. They're, they focus more on, on teams and cities than, like, the entire league, it seems like. And, and I'm, I'm not sure if that's a fair criticism, but they were more focused on, all right, we need to get, you know, these specific cities involved in our teams instead of, all right, how do we, how do we grow the entire league as a whole from uh, spreading the word? I mean, I don't know about, about you, Mike and, and Connor, but I, I would say I'm, I'm by, you know, an above-average soccer fan, you know, I'm in the 90th percentile of soccer fan in the U S I cannot tell you the last time I watched an MLS game on TV. And that has, that has so many different factors. I mean, that has something to do with like the players on the field, you know, the games, the cities, et cetera. But I mean, it's, it's going to be a challenge to, you know, really get over that hump. And I think that the 2026 world cup will help. I think all these other factors will help, but I mean, it's, it's a challenge that they have to address in order to, you know, really take that next step to, to grow the league. Yeah, so that leads into a point I was going to say, because I do think, um, you're right, there is a lot of regional, uh, really su- successful teams on a regional basis, if you think of teams like Seattle or Portland. And I think the way soccer is trending, it's a very big sport uh, among these kind of younger generations. And I think kind of basketball and soccer uh, are really kind of these big sports for, you know, uh, millennial and now Gen Z. Uh, But the thing is, you have a lot of younger people that are soccer fans. But the issue comes when you ask someone my age or any of our ages, you know, what is your favorite soccer team? You know, their answer is going to be Liverpool or Barcelona or Bayern Munich, right? Their answer is almost never going to be actually an American team. So how do you transfer, um, you know, this kind of, support for the game of soccer and you know everyone's playing fifa so everyone knows all these teams and players globally but how do you transfer that into actually getting strong interest in the local teams and i think that is actually what the number one biggest challenge is because if you think of these other sports uh, the nfl the mlb the nba pretty much every other sport every other major sport in the world most of them the best league for it is in america Right. As in the MLS, the MLS, I don't know what exactly the number is, but I think it would be fair to say it's something in the range of like maybe the 10th best league in the world. So it's it's better than people think it is. That's pretty accurate. I mean, it's better than people think it is for sure. Um, And I agree with that. I just think that and I know we're drifting away from the original conversation, um, but I think that. The fact that there are so many international leagues available now to watch, you know, NBC has uh, the Premier League. Now you have the Bundesliga and Serie A is now on ESPN+. Plus. You could watch the Scottish League on ESPN+. Plus. There are so many platforms to watch matches now that you could never before. And I know you want the MLS to grow, and I know we want that to become ratings to continue to, you know, to go up and all that. But I still – I think – if you're watching soccer internationally, I think that is without a doubt helping grow the sport in the country, even though it's not necessarily profiting the MLS. But I think it also could, because if you're a Liverpool fan and you're watching them every week and then you're like, I just want to keep watching soccer. I mean, these games are happening in the morning for us. Um, and so the games that are in the MLS take place in the afternoon and night. So if you are a soccer fan, you could watch soccer all day. And I understand that that will then impede on like, you know, college football and college basketball, but that's why you have multiple screens in your house. I just think that that's something that could work uh, in the future. So I don't think it's, I think, like I said, I'm very optimistic, but I understand that this league needs to figure out a strategy, coherent strategy soon um, because there's a lot of inconsistencies that the MLS has shown over the years and continues to show. And, and I think that their, their strategy, it, it, not that growing teams was bad. I mean, it, it's, it's healthy for the league to have these excited fan bases like the Atlantas of the world like, that you mentioned. It's just 
in 10 years, does that translate to, all right, there's this entire new generation, the, the gen, you know, gen Z, the zoomers out there, like, are, are they really passionate and going to game because, you know, their parents were taking them out, et, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, the, the more exciting fan bases is good for the league. It's just, when you look at every single major sports league in the world, you know, Premier League included, the, the TV rights is what has fueled their growth. Um, and without these, you know, big contracts, it's really hard to invest in, you know, new stadiums, trying to get these expensive players in other leagues to come to your league because of transfer fees. Um, but I think you're right. I think, I think the, the 2026 world cup that's you know going to be in, in North America is, is a moment that MLS has to grab and run with. Um, and, and who knows? I mean, I, 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 I'm optimistic on men's soccer as a whole, but major league soccer for at least the next five years or so, I'm, I'm cautious because I, I don't think their financials are anywhere near what they need to be. Um, but I mean, they've had some, some, some billionaires and, and, you know, other ridiculously wealthy people that can afford to lose $10 million a year, every year for a decade. Um, it's just, you know, if that well dries up, uh, it's not going to be good. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think it's going to be interesting to see how, the, how, once again, how the future, how the future plays out. I think what's one positive thing though is, you know, for the future, we said, you know, who's watching most of these games? Who's logging on the ESPN Plus? Who's watching the MLS? Who's watching soccer? Younger people in their twenties, in their teens, younger generations. And at least for me, I don't know if you two can attest, but one of the reasons I got into sports is because my dad took me to games and mm-hmm. watched games with me and told me history. And so, you know, 15, 10, 20 years from now, you know, this, our generations and the younger generations are going to be doing the same thing with their kids. But because we're into soccer, because younger generations are, you are into soccer, you're going to be teaching your kids about soccer. And then maybe they will become interested from you. So I think that's a positive element as well down the road. Um, you know, it's kind of a hot take for me, but I do believe that I could see like 30 years from now, the MLS kind of becoming more popular or at least soccer in general in the U.S. becoming more popular than baseball. That's just my personal opinion. Um, Cause I think baseball for the younger generations is a fading sport. In my opinion, you play it by all means, you play it when you're younger, but, and I know the ratings for the world series were pretty high this year, but once again, that's like an older generation. That's just my opinion. It could be completely wrong. Baseball is clearly still a top three sport in this country, but if we're looking maybe in like 2000 and like 40 or something like that, I don't think it's that unreasonable to say that baseball loses a lot of this, a lot of the support that it's had just because of, you know, the same things. It's a bore. It takes forever. It's boring. I don't want to watch that. And I think, Youth soccer is so crucial in this country, and if it continues to grow, I think it could very well maybe take baseball spot. Once again, it's a very um, – it's a lot to go – a lot that's going to happen before that, but I think it's, it's possible in my opinion. I think yeah, both trends are definitely, you know, looking that direction where from – especially from young people, baseball's trending downwards, soccer's trending upwards. Um, I just am – I'm concerned, but I'm also like, from a, from an MLS perspective, going to games, it's just been so much fun. Like, I don't know if you guys have ever been to an MLS game, but like I've been to a game in game in Portland, game in DC, you know, a couple of games in Denver. Like it's so much fun. And, you know, it's just never captivated me of like, wow, you know, and I think, I think a lot of it is because you can turn on your TV channel and watch five of the leagues that are just better. I mean, it's almost like, you know, if, if there's two teams you don't care about, would you rather watch college basketball or professional? You're going to watch professional. And I don't think the, the talent discrepancy is that high. But, um, you know, you're always going to be attracted to better quality on the field. Um, and so there's this – I mean, there's a plethora of, of issues that MLS is facing. But, you know, when it's, hey, talk about something that, that is slept on, the financial status of MLS – um, is, is concerning and, and, you know, definitely needs some, some more conversation. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, just as like one last thing, I do think, uh, part of it, a lot, a big part of it comes down to the fact that, as you said at the very beginning, that the U S men's national team has not been particularly successful. I think this next, uh, we have, we have this kind of emerging group of players that will probably be very good. 
Uh, and if they can, especially if they can have a big showing in that 2026 World Cup that we host, if they could make a run to, you know, the quarterfinals or hopefully even deeper than that, uh, I think that could really jumpstart. And I think that's actually possible for this group of players. I've said semifinals, actually, in my opinion. Yeah. I think they can actually do that. That, that, that would be incredible. Uh, but I also think soccer does need to become something that is more accessible to larger amounts of the population at a youth level. Uh, because I know my my brother, uh, my younger brother, did, was, was playing soccer for a few years, uh, and now he's playing basketball now. But uh, one of the things that we realize is just to be on a lot of these teams, how expensive it actually is. Um, and that's something, and to be fair, that's kind of happening in America with all kinds of sports. But when you think internationally, um, soccer is just something, I mean, it really is one of the simplest sports to actually physically play. You need a ball. And then even if you're just kids playing in a playground or something, you can use whatever you want as goals. All you need is a ball. Yeah. I mean, it, it should be, um, you know, way less of, you know, hurdles to, to jump over to play. Whereas now it's okay. In order to get noticed by the scouts and be on the teams and the club teams, it's, all right, you got to travel to all these practices, travel to all these games, be in all these tournaments um, and play year round. I mean, it's, it's, there's a fall league, indoor league, spring league, club team, high school league. I mean, it's just, it's nonstop. And, and from a financial perspective, it, it definitely, you know, puts a burden on, on these families, a lot of them who can't afford it. And that's why you, you see basketball rising and, and the, the elite levels of all those sports have similar, you know, financial constraints. Um, but you know, overall youth soccer or soccer in general is, is still the number one sport, um, played by, by youth in America. Um, it's just, you know, do people love it enough at the age of eight to continue at it when they're 16, 17, 18? Yeah. And I think also, um, you know, there was, uh, this is, comes up a lot, but I think another problem with that also is that uh, a lot of youth soccer is very upper middle upper class oriented as well. Yeah. The registration fees are just preposterous and it takes away a lot of other uh, people that probably would want to play soccer, but they don't have the, they, you know, these programs are just isolating them because they're so expensive and it makes it very difficult. And so that's a problem I think that needs to be fixed as well. If you want to grow this game, you have to make the sport accessible to everyone. Otherwise, you know, you're not going to get a lot of the talent that you, you may have been able to if you're not – these these registration is just so high and these, these leagues are so demanding. Um, so I think that that's something that needs to be worked on as well. The fact that you're, you know, only allowing some of these prices and some of these programs, you know, upper class people can only afford. I think that's something that needs to be fixed because this should be a sport that's accessible to everyone in the country, not just the upper class, which is something that we need to work on. Well, and that's something MLS, I mean, I, I know we're going a little bit off, off the uh, rails here, but, but that's something MLS addressed or, or, or noticed like 15 years ago when they started this whole homegrown player initiative where, you know, most of the, most of the teams have their own, you know, academy um, and, and is focused on developing the youth that are, you know, in their local area, um, which is huge. And I mean, every single pro team in Europe has something similar. Um, but, you know, the expansion of that, is, is just as critical to, you know, MLS's success in the future as, as is the, the new media rights. Yeah, I, I would agree with that completely. And thank you for kind of bringing this story uh, to us here on Slept on Sports. I think we all are soccer fans. I think we all want soccer to grow in this country. And I think it has a great potential to do so. Um, but there are some of these kind of challenges in the way. But we do have, like we said, with the World Cup particularly, a uh, really great opportunity to change that in the future. That was good, Jake. Yeah. USA. You got it. <laughs> Who wants All to go right. next? You want to go? Sure, I'll go. All Let's right. Go. What do you got for us today? All right. So uh, this is a story that I like a lot, actually. Um, it's kind. It's 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 sad for the person, but it's comical because of the way it happens. Uh, so this is the story of a NFL running back. Okay, he played from 2012 to 2015. Didn't have a very famous career by any stretch of the imagination. He played for the Dolphins very briefly. He played for the Ravens. He was on their practice squad, uh, so didn't really see any action for them. He played for the Patriots, which is where he's mostly known for. Then he went back to the Dolphins, and then he went to the Jags, tore his knee up, 
and he's out of the league instantly. Jonas Gray. Very nice. Yes. Ah. Yes. Yes. I like it, Ramonde. I like it. That's awesome. Yes. Why not? Jonas Gray. What a story this is, I have to say. He is a Super Bowl champion as well, so I guess that's something that he can have. But I think it's funny. His career statistics, he only played 16 games in the NFL. He wow. only ran 134 times. He ran for 588 yards and five touchdowns. Nothing spectacular by any stretch of the imagination, but the part of the story is in one game, I'll do the, the, 30 for, the old school 30 for 30. Go for it. What if I told you – what if I told you that Jonas Gray ran for 201 yards and four touchdowns <laughs> in one game? It's absurd. And then he barely ever saw the field ever again. And Jake, you probably know what the story behind that is. But before we get to that, let's just quickly go through who this person was. Who was Jonas Gray? So looking up his high school career, which I think is interesting. Okay. He was actually pretty good. He's from Detroit area. Um, he had over 2,500 rushing yards, 32 touchdowns in his senior season. Um, was an All-American Bowl participant in the U.S. Army All-American Bowl game. So this is a pretty solid guy. I think he was a four-star recruit, I believe. Yeah, and fourth best running back in his class. But it's interesting, his, his physical uh, dimensions are fascinating. 5'10", 225 pounds. Okay, so this yeah. guy is, is, is – have fun tackling him. <laughs> that is very uh, much the modern running back. Yes. Uh, he also was a track and field runner, uh, and he came in third in the state finals for the 100-meter dash. Wow. So, like, I'd like to see that footage because that would be fascinating. <laughs> yeah. um, but, uh, Jake, where does he go to college? Do you know? Oh, see, now that's, that's testing my, my random sports trivia knowledge in my head. Um, I don't know. He, he reminds me of a Big Ten back, so I'm just going to pull out a Big Ten school. Uh, I'm going to go with, um, I don't know, Purdue. That's actually not a bad guess. It's kind of in the same area, actually, um, same state, um, but a much bigger uh, program than that. He went to Notre Dame, actually. Oh, geez. Yeah. yeah, he went to Notre Dame from 2008 to 2011. He didn't get much playing time there because there were other running backs at the time that were ahead of him. But in his senior year in 2011, he does play a lot. Uh, he has 791 yards, 12 touchdowns. For an eight-win Notre Dame team, this was Brian Kelly's first year, I believe, in 2011. Uh, a second year in 2011, I believe. So it was still early on in the Brian Kelly rebuilding era. Unfortunately, though, he tours ACL, MCL, and LCL against Boston College at the end of the season on senior day. So that's like at, worth kind of triple crown right there. Jeez. That's not, that, that's not, yeah, this is not American Pharaoh triple crown success. This is your you have every part of your knee is injured. So that's a problem for him because he went undrafted as a result right. because teams were like, I'm not going to touch that. He's he's got you know we don't know what his future is going to hold. Um, so he didn't get drafted that summer. He got picked up by the Dolphins, but he was one of the final cuts for that season right before. Then he got picked up by the Ravens the following year, uh, but he just made the practice squad, doesn't play, and it looks like Jonas Gray is just going to fade into existence. But in early January 2014, he signed by the Patriots. Patriots always finding random players that they can just bring on to that team, play right? And play. Typical Bill Belichick thing. Absolutely. He makes the team. So he's on the practice squad. He's just on the practice squad for the whole summer and for the first part of the 2014 season. But he makes the team in October. One of the reasons is because Stephen Ridley, if you remember that yes. name, wow. yeah. he got hurt during the season. So they brought in Jonas Gray. And actually, his debut came Thursday night football against the Jets. This is October 2014. He only has three rushes for 12 yards, nothing special, okay? The following week, he plays the Bears, 17 carries. They're lead back. 86 yards. Yeah. Not bad. The following week, Broncos, and this is a tough Bronco defense. This is during the um, Peyton Manning is – right, he's during Peyton Manning's years. Very good defense. Um, they're going to win the Super Bowl the next year. 12 rushes, 33 yards. You know, it's tough against that Broncos defense, but they all won every single game. So Jonas Gray's like, all right, I'm starting. We're three and oh, this is beautiful stuff. They had a bye in week nine. So they're getting ready for the Colts in week 10, the Andrew Luck Colts. And Bill Belichick and Josh McDaniels, the offensive coordinator, still there. Um, they knew that one of the best defensive linemen, Arthur Jones on the Colts, who was a big time run stuffer at the time, they thought they knew he was going to be out for that game against the Patriots. And this game is in Indianapolis. So, being Belichick, 
He decides we're going to run the football down their throats in this game. During this game against the Colts, I believe this was a Sunday night game, uh, if I can remember. They had, uh, but don't quote me on that, there were six offensive linemen that the Patriots had, two tight ends, and they just said we're going to run 225-pound Jonas Gray (laughs) all day long. And this ends up leading to the game that I mentioned before, 37 carries. (laughs) He carried the ball 37 times, 201 yards, and he scored four touchdowns, one in each quarter. One in each quarter. He got a touchdown in the first, second, third, and why not in the fourth? The Patriots won 42-20. to This was a franchise record. Don't know if it'll get broken anytime soon. He was the first NFL running back since 1921 to score four rushing touchdowns in a game, having never scored one before. <laughs> so at 1921, that was probably like the NFL's like first game, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's unbelievable, almost 100 yeah. years ago. Uh, and it was a very emotional scene. His mother was at the game in Indianapolis. She was crying. Everyone was having a great time. He was on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Jonas Gray looks like this. He's going to break. He's going to break through the NFL. He has made his moment. He overcame that terrible injury. He's playing for Belichick. He's playing for the Patriots. Tom Brady, unbelievable. But as you said, he only ends up with like 580 <laughs> career yards. And we've already gone through about what, 300, 300, oh, 400 yards. Jonas. Yeah. Also, re- real quick, if, if any other coach other than Bill Belichick and maybe like two or three others ran the ball 37 times in a game, I feel like they'd get fired. Like, that is just insane. When's the last time someone's gotten 37 carries in a game? Well, right, a long time ago. I feel like that's something you see in high school, maybe. But beyond that, it's High just, school's in, like, 1980s NFL football. Not even, like, safe. <laughs> yeah, let's give it yeah, – in high school, like, let's give it to the set – like, the 400-pound running back. Oh, yeah. just going to, like, kill these, like, kids that are, like, yeah, the, like two yeah, feet smaller. Derrick Henry. Yeah, De- Derrick – exactly. Derrick yeah. Henry, exactly. Uh, but doing this in the NFL is just hilarious. Uh, and that once again, that Colts team was good. That these two teams meet each other in the AFC Championship game That's later right. in the season. That's a Deflate Gate game. So this is a good Colts team at the time. Uh, but obviously, it doesn't end well for Jonas Gray. So what happened to Jonas Gray after this game? Because he's never really going to see the field ever again. So that Tuesday, that Tuesday, the Steelers released Legarrette Blunt, and so the Patriots were like. We want him. Don't and he was him. on the Patriots before. They bring him back. Don't now, sign anyone. Yeah. Anyone. <laughs> and so he's back. So now Jonas Gray's going to compete with, with LeGarrette, and it's not going to be 100% easy for him. Um, but he still feels like I'm going to play. I'm still going to get carries. We can split carries. Boom, boom, boom. Run it down. They're playing the Lions. Uh, it's his hometown team. He was a Lions fan. Grew up in that area. So everyone's excited for this game coming up against Detroit. However, Thursday night – Thursday night, okay, he is up late watching game film on his iPad. So it's not like he's, like, watching, like, you know, Family Feud or something. He is watching game film. He wants to get going. He's ready to go. Just being a good teammate. Just being a good teammate. That's all he wants to do. But, and this is all according to Jonas Gray, so keep that in mind. This is, you know, the only person that knows this is him. So the information comes from him. He says he set his alarm for 7.30 a.m. on his phone. Mm-mm. Okay, meeting is at eight o'clock in the morning. Okay, first off, that's not giving you a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, does, does he live across the street? Like, come on. I think the practice is only, I think he's pretty close. I, I'm going to assume. Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, is he going to shower in the morning? Like, I, I, I don't know what's going to happen. That's something. quite the routine. Like, like coffee, breakfast. I don't. I don't know. I. It's just. <laughs> this is before uh, the Zoom meeting era. That's right. He has to be there. It's not virtual. If it's virtual, he could have got up at 7.55. It would have been all good. Yeah. Uh, maybe 7.58 even. But, no, he's got to get ready. So he sets the alarm for 7.30 a.m., you know, and he's tired. He just watched all his film on the iPad. Once again, this is what he claims. He says he plugged the charger into the wall outlet, and he went to sleep, as anyone would, right? Plug yeah. the charger into the phone. You plug the uh, the, the charger in. I just plug the phone into the charger. No, charger into good, the phone. Good explanation <laughs> of how phones get charged. So, yeah, wait, Mike, Mike, back up. So how do you charge your phone? Sure, right, so this is what you do, okay? Uh-huh. You find the charger. Right. Whatever it is, right? Uh-huh. And there's a little slot in the phone. <laughs> oh, wait, you, hold on. I'm taking notes. Wait, 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 go back. So oh, you... Okay, so first step one, Uh huh. get a charger. Yeah. Okay? And if you need to refer, I can refer you some chargers <laughs> as well. <laughs> um, and then... You know, there's a little spot on the phone, okay, where you insert the charging device. Right. So, so, so Jonas Gray does that. He does that. 
He has a so connect, he says, connected on both ends. So he says. And then he has the really difficult thing is plugging it into the outlet, though. Right. I mean, it's tough. But apparently he said he did it. Um, but when he woke up in the morning, the battery was dead. The phone was not plugged into the wall properly. Oh, no. Don't know how that happened. What, what time is this? Well, he doesn't wake up till 8.30 a.m. That's not good. His alarm never That's went off. Um, the phone battery died. Uh, it never charged. He was never alerted. He woke up half hour later, hour later than he would have wanted, half hour after the meeting started. Uh, and so I don't know how you guys would feel in that moment in time. I'd probably just maybe just fade into <laughs> into the bed and never get out because yeah, Bill Belichick I, may kill me. I think I would feel terrible, but at the same I mean, he had four touchdowns in the last game. Yeah, but it's Bill Belichick. Bill Belichick, who earlier one season, the Randy Moss time, Randy Moss was late, and he punished him. So you think Jonas Gray is going to get off if Randy Moss did it? Probably not. No, right? <laughs> um, so he was panicking. He calls some of the coaches. He didn't call Belichick. He calls some of the coaches and says, what should I do? And they said, don't come to the facilities. Stay away until 5.30 p.m. I don't know why. I, I tried to look that up, but so I, don't know, I don't know why. Yeah. Um, he goes there at 5.30 p.m. He meets with Belichick there. Uh, allegedly, Bill Belichick is on the treadmill, walking on the treadmill, reading his notes. Okay? Doesn't really care. And uh, as Jonas Gray says, Bill Belichick kept saying to him, we just can't have that. We just can't have that. Uh, which makes sense. I mean, come on. This is professional football. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the writing was on the wall then. Now, we still don't know, though, at that point, if Jonas Gray, like, what the situation is going to be. He was active for the next game. Mm-hmm. Okay? Um, and – Actually, I'm sorry. He doesn't play the next game against the Lions. He doesn't see the field. doesn't see the field against the Lions. Okay? Mm. So Jonas Gray's probably thinking at this point, like, all right, one game punishment. Yeah, under- understandable. Understandable, whatever. I messed up. The next week, they're at the Packers. His stat line for this game, one carry, four yards. Hey, hey, it's better than zero. <laughs> it's better than zero, but I would, I would start to get a little concerned. I'm a little point. concerned, especially after the next game against the Chargers when it's two carries for nine yards. Hey, that's improvement. Hey, yeah, that's maybe, maybe that's like three for 14. That's double the carries. Now, then, then they play the Dolphins, 11 carries, 62 yards. Pretty good. I don't know when. I'd have to figure it out. I mean, I don't know when that, you know, if they were beating the Dolphins by a lot or if it oh, was. yeah, yeah. I, I didn't look at the score. Um, but, you know, maybe he came on the end. He does play then the Jets. He scores a touchdown in that game on five yards rushing, so I'm assuming it was a goal line play. Um, and then he doesn't really see the field after that again. Doesn't play in the playoffs. Doesn't play in the AFC Championship game. Um Oh, he did play. I'm sorry, he did play in the AFC Championship game. He had four carries and four yards in that game. Okay, but he doesn't play in the Super Bowl. He's a healthy mm-hmm. scratch for that game. He doesn't play, and that's of course the epic 28-24 Seahawks. Seahawks game, yeah. right? The Malcolm Butler pick in the end zone. So he does get a Super Bowl ring. He does win a Super Bowl, but he doesn't play. He gets cut by the Patriots in the following preseason. Um, then he plays for the Dolphins. He only has. He only plays, what, six games for them. Doesn't really get much action. He plays for the Jaguars then. Uh, and in the 2016 season, he tore, he tears his quad in mm-hmm. training camp. Ugh. And he's done. He never plays again. And that's what happens to running backs. It's like the first major injury. That's and it. I mean, he was, uh, yeah. and, and at that point, I mean, he's already like five, six years in. Right. There's other, there's other people out there. So this is just it's – a, it's a sad story because, you know, you want to root for guys to succeed in the NFL. It's a ruthless league. Yeah. You know, nobody cares what you did, you know, earlier. They want to know what you're going to do now. And, you know, for Jonas Gray, things would have been different if he had just woke up, his charged phone didn't well, die. And, the and that's where I'm curious too because, you know, as, as you said, they just signed LeGarrette Blunt, And no offense to Jonas Gray, but LeGarrette Blunt is a way better running back than Jonas Gray. Mm-hmm. And so even if his alarm doesn't go off, I still think he loses that job out to Blunt. I mean, they had Shane Vereen. Shane Vereen, you know, was the James White before James White and the, you know, right after Kevin Falk, you know, those, those are Kevin Falk, the original. One. Yeah, the original. <laughs> and so, you know, they had Shane Vereen. They had this, this, this receiving back and like this, you know, blunt force trauma back. And I think Jonas Gray loses that battle no matter what, and it's no longer with the Patriots. But instead of going from four touchdowns to one more, I think he has a, a, a longer career um, with that alarm clock. But, you know, you, you're right. It's just it's such a sad story and, and uh, definitely going to be double-checking how I charge my phone from now on. 
<laughs> well, well, do you think you might be on the Patriots? <laughs> Maybe. You never know. Well, yeah. you might have that. You might have a midterm, and you might uh, sleep through the midterm. It's possible. It's <laughs> yeah, happened before. Yeah. I know someone that has. <laughs> yes, yes, we do. <laughs> Um, Very important to make sure your phone is always charged. No, but I agree with the Garrett Blunt comment, you know, because he ends up being a big, you know, he ends up winning that Super Bowl with the Patriots. He ends up return, he ends up winning again with the Patriots, that famous Falcons comeback, and then he wins one with the Eagles the year after. So I ultimately do agree with that. But like I said, I mean, uh, like you said, Jonas Gray, he would have gotten more time, you would assume. Uh, Bill Belichick would have given him more carries. He would have uh, maybe at least gone to another team and had more success on there, you know, as opposed to barely seeing time on the Dolphins. But ultimately, though, you know, he does get hurt, and that ends his career. And he already got hurt in college. So you wonder, even if he was on the Patriots, even if he was playing, would he have gotten hurt again? And it just ended anyway. So, I mean, that's – And that's one thing about Belichick that is a very fair criticism is his history with running backs, where he's always been good with receiving backs, the ones I mentioned. But – when you go from 2014, just off the top of my head, you know, they had, they had Blunt, you know, a big, strong, powerful back, but they were, they were never able to find the one that fit them the best. They signed Steven Jackson. They had Steven Jackson for the 2015 playoffs, who like, came out of retirement. They right. signed Mike Gillisley, who was, you know, a very similar <laughs> prototypical back from the Bills that they signed. Um, and then in the last couple of years, you know, they, they tried to, you know, have the, uh, um, through the draft, solve it with uh, Michelle. Um, and he really hasn't totally panned out yet. I mean, he's still only in the second year, but, um, you know, he was another one of those, all right, maybe this is finally the fix I'm going for. And, you know, maybe he, maybe he does beat up a lot and maybe he, he goes out from there, but, um, yeah, I mean, that's something that Belichick is, um, always had a rotating door policy at, uh, it seems like. And, and so it's, it's interesting how he's never really been able to find that, you know, prototypical, you know, three down back or two down back and, um, Jonas Craig could have been it. I think Bill Belichick, just his goal in life is to just frustrate every fantasy player ever yes. to not know who is going to get any carries or catches in the backfield for the Patriots every single week and just to mess with everyone's sanity because every time I see a Patriot back, I'm just like, I don't know what's going to happen with him because I don't know who's going to get the ball. So maybe that's just his goal to just – be a troll in fantasy, which I could actually honestly see. <laughs> I, think, I, I, think, I think you would love that. Yeah. Talk about someone that does not care for fantasy football at all. I think Bill Belichick may, may win that award for I literally hate everything about this. I bet you he doesn't even know, like, how the scoring works. Like, if you, if you ask Bill Belichick, hey, do you know what, you know, uh, uh, a point per reception means? He'd have no clue. <laughs> and nor would he care either. <laughs> Just no. the thought of asking him, like, maybe one day one of us will get, like, a, a press conference with Bill Belichick, and then if we want to end our careers right there and never enter the press room ever <laughs> again, we could ask him a fantasy football question and uh, see what happens. It would be hilarious. They would be, yeah, then we'd be ostracized from the community. Can you imagine that just being in the back of the press room being like, hey, Bill, I've got, uh, I've got Edelman and I've got Harry. Uh, they're both in a PPR league. Um, who do you think I should start and sit? But may, maybe it's actually genius, though. Like, maybe he is just so tired of all the same questions over and over again and just giving the same answers that maybe just the ridiculousness of that question, he would actually, like, find hilarious. Like, it would be maybe something that would actually break him in a positive way. Hey, he's doing subway commercials now. So, I mean, if you told me that 10 years ago, I'd say you're, you're, you're high on something. So, you know, maybe, maybe he's changing. Well, same thing with Nick. I mean, I was, same thing with Nick Saban because now he's doing Aflac commercials, and he seems all more accessible now. So you're talking about Saban and Belichick, the two giants of football, who will always get this personality of you know they they don't really they just want to win games and they're going to be rough around the edges and they're going to be annoying with the media and all that stuff like that. But now it seems like they're trying to be hip and they're trying to be cool because they know that that's kind of where the future is going. I know you know Belichick. I'm surprised he was in that Subway commercial, but Saban especially seemed like the last few years. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that. You know, Clemson got really good, and they played hip, exciting football mm. with Dabo being this players' loving coach. And then same thing with Coach O last year, and Saban's like, maybe I have to do that now. Maybe I have to kind of adapt and adjust. And I think maybe Belichick's thinking that to an extent. The NFL's obviously they have the same agent, so that also could be it. Their agent, um, you know, they share the same agent, so I'm sure the agent's like, all right, how do I get more commission money? Is, is, Very good point. <laughs> is, it, is it Jake from State Farm? Is it Jake from State Farm? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good.
Yeah, I that was, that was great, Mike. I I uh, haven't heard the name Jonas Gray in a long time. I'm very impressed that you remembered it too, um, because uh, it's obviously one of those things that you know. It's like remember that guy that one game. <laughs> but, I mean, that's an amazing game. It's like yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. Um, well, and it's and it's crazy too because they they ran the exact same blueprint uh, or game plan in the AFC Championship game. They. They ran the. I mean, they they beat the Colts like forty five to to three or forty five to fourteen in the in the Deflate Gate game, and they just did the exact same thing. They put on six offensive linemen and just pounded the ball. Um, and you know, when the like the 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 big DVD they put out at the end of the year, uh, their offensive line coach at the time was was saying, you know, we were just going to do it until they stopped it, and they they never stopped it. Yeah, why not? Just keep pounding away, uh, and that, and that works in that game, and that's that's the, that's that's the beauty of it. So. Um, you know, it's funny no, going to Notre Dame too, uh, is just interesting. Like that's, that's big time. That's big time for this guy. Uh, and you know, once again, you wonder with the injuries, if he doesn't get hurt in Notre Dame, does he get drafted? I don't know, but you know, you wonder if his career would have started off differently as well. Um, there's a lot of what ifs, a lot of what ifs is a lot of what ifs Jonas sports. Gray. Yeah, with Jonas Gray especially. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so you're talking about the Jonas Gray game, which is basically a story. I mean, it's a good story, but it is centered around one game. I'm going to be talking about one game as well. Uh, kind of the second part of my story from uh, last week when I was talking about how the Arkansas Razorbacks played in a six or seven overtime football game three years in a row. I want to talk about another crazy overtime game this week. This is a 2006 college football game between North Texas and Florida Inter- International, okay? Okay. And when I say this, you might be initially be thinking, like, why are we talking about this game? And you would be very right to ask that question because these are two not very noteworthy programs. I don't think there's any NFL players or anyone interesting that's coming out of this game. But this is one of the most absurd games that has ever been played. And I'm going to tell you why. There have been five games in college football history, in FBS history, that have gone to seven overtimes. Okay, I'm going to read you out the scores of those games. So first we have a story I talked about last week, Arkansas beating Ole Miss 58-56 in 2001. Then also I talked about last week in 2003, Arkansas beats Kentucky 71-63. We have a 2017 game between Western Michigan and Buffalo where Western Michigan wins 71-68. And we have in 2018, of course, the Texas A&M 74-72 over LSU game. And then finally, we have this 2006 game between North, <laughs> between North Texas and Florida International in which North Texas wins. <laughs> it's actually 25 to 22. What? What? 25. How is that even possible? 22 in seven overtimes. My dear Lord. So we're going to talk about that game. Please do. (laughs) Please do. So the first thing to know about these teams is that they both suck. (laughs) This should be kind of obvious. These teams are both, they both now play in Conference USA. At the time, they're both in the Sun Belt, right? So uh, North Texas enters this game. They're one and four coming into this game. And they're going to finish the season three and nine. So this is not a good team. Uh, still better than Florida International, however, because Florida International enters at 0-5, and, and spoiler alert, they're going to finish 0-12. Oh, my God. This is, this is going to be a winless football team. Uh, the fans are not excited for this game whatsoever. Uh, this is being played at Fouts Field, uh, which at the time has a capacity of 30,500 fans. <laughs> Uh, Only 15,123 fans show up to the game. So it's a bit under 50% capacity. So obviously not a lot of interest in this game. And and for good reason. Although now, in retrospect, I would have loved to be at this football game uh, (laughs) based on all the ridiculous stuff that happens. So most of this story takes place in overtime, but I'm going to quickly run through how we get there. So in the first quarter, game opens with a Florida international punt. Then... North Texas gets the ball. They throw an interception on their very first play. And Florida International gets the ball again on their own 17, right? They go three and out. They're punting from their own 22-yard line. Now, we don't have video of this game, I don't believe. But from them punting on their own 22-yard line. No one wanted to see this game. No one's interested at all. 
Uh, but I can only assume that the snap for the punt sails over the punter's head because from their own 22-yard line, this play ends in a safety. That is just – wow. So North Texas goes up 2 nothing in this game, <laughs> and they take a 5 nothing lead by the end of the first quarter. Every point is very valuable in this football game. <laughs> so this is a big lead. It's a big lead. That's like a Big Ten, like Iowa, um, Michigan game from, from 1898 right there. <laughs> Absolutely. So highlights from the second quarter. Uh, no points are scored in the second quarter. But a few highlights. At one point, North Texas gets into a third and 37 situation, uh, which is not good. And then later on in the quarter, uh, Florida International turns it over on downs. And then on the next possession, North Texas turns it over on downs. Uh, and then on the next possession, uh, Florida International turns it over on downs. Uh, hey, at least they're consistent. Yeah, yeah, they get, they, get, they get stopped on a fourth and goal from the one. Um, so at halftime, uh, it's 5 nothing still. Okay. Uh, in the third quarter, uh, Florida International actually goes on an 80-yard touchdown drive. They take the lead. 6-5, good for them. Uh, the what? extra point gets blocked. Sounds right. Sounds about right. <laughs> they said this is not surprising by any yep. stretch. Uh, and then later in the quarter, Florida International will actually get a pick six. So they will take a commanding 13-5 to lead. Uh, heading into the fourth quarter. And actually, the end of this fourth quarter is actually very good. So with five minutes left, North Texas uh, kicks a field goal to make it 13-8. Then they immediately get a stop. They get the ball back. They score a touchdown, get the two-point conversion. They lead 16-13 to with two minutes left. Uh, and I should note that this will be the final touchdown of the game. <laughs> <laughs> this will be the final touchdown of the game, and we're heading to seven overtimes. So that gives you a sense of what's to come. Uh, but good news for FIU. They go on a great drive in the last two minutes, and they kick a 28-yard field goal with two seconds left in the game to make it 16-16. All right, so we're headed to overtime at 16-16. And remind you, this final score of this game will be 25-22. <laughs> So we got a lot of football left to play. And I think this is where I would create a, I would start a running count of how many field goals are missed in overtime. Oh, no. Because it will be a lot. <laughs> minutes. <laughs> so first overtime, okay, Florida International fumbles the ball, so they lose possession. North Texas, any points will win them the game. They start at the 25-yard line. They go backwards. They get to fourth and 19. Oh, my. They kick a 51-yard field goal, <laughs> and they miss. I mean, that, you know, fair enough. <laughs> One field goal missed, heading to, heading to the second overtime. Second overtime, actually, each team does make a field goal. So North Texas makes a 26-yarder. Florida International makes a 37-yarder. It's 19-19 heading into the third overtime. Right. So far, I mean, the first overtime was a little iffy, but we're, it's, not getting, it's not too crazy just yet. Third overtime, it gets crazy. Oh, no. Third overtime is when each kicker should probably be released mid-game. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. Not already at this point. Scholar, scholarship cut. <laughs> scholarship cut in the third overtime. Third overtime, Florida International gets the ball first. They get down to the nine-yard line. 26-yard field goal attempt. Wide right. Oh, boy. <laughs> North Texas gets the ball. They get down to the 12-yard line. <laughs> To kick a game-winning 29-yard field goal, they missed this one, too. So two missed field goals. It's three missed field goals so far in overtime. We're headed to 4 OT, where North Texas misses a 38-yard field goal and Florida International misses a 36-yard field goal. Oh, my gosh. At this point, I feel like both teams should just be like, you know what? We don't deserve to win. Yeah. Let's just leave. So that is now two overtimes in a row where there's been a combined four missed field goals. Can you imagine being there? Through four overtimes, <laughs> through four overtimes, the overtime score is three three. Okay, and we play on. It what's what's the total at this point? It's nineteen nineteen. Can you so, imagine being a sports better and like you know the the over under is like forty five, <laughs> and, and you go to a seven overtime game, yeah. and you like barely hit it, and you're sweating it. <laughs> you're thinking, I right, got this. <laughs> You're sweating it in like five OT in this 1919 game. Granted, if you're betting the over under on a North Texas Florida international game, um, you know I think I think you got some issues. Yeah. yeah, you have bigger problems, but also though, easily can see it. 
Like, come on. <laughs> come on now. This is a perfect game for that. Yes. There's at least one person out there that this game, betting-wise, like really yes. screwed up. Yes. their heart. I will say as a side note, uh, I did. I said last week that 1996 was the first full season of overtime in FBS play. That's right. So coming into this game, North Texas is the only FBS team that has not played an overtime game yet. They don't know what to do. So they got their money's <laughs> worth in this one, basically, is what I'm trying to say. This is all for them. They hadn't played an overtime game in 10 years, and they, well, they effectively played seven overtime games <laughs> they in made this up one for game. It. They made up for it. So fifth overtime, 1919. Uh, we do get lucky. Both teams actually make their field goals this time around. Now, hey, I, hey, kickers are both <laughs> <laughs> I, I do think you have the right to ask why in 10 overtime possessions, neither team has scored the yeah, touchdown, say, which would have ended the game. <laughs> uh, but in, but they do. And, and F, FIU, they get down to the two yard line and instead of going for it, they end up kicking a 19 yard field goal. That's an insult. You should lose on that. So they, they make a 19-yarder. North Texas responds, 39 yard field goal. Wait, Fantastic. so you're telling me that the 0-5 team coming into this game had yes. the ball on the two-yard line yes. and decided, let's kick the field goal? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> to be fair, judging by the last two overtimes, they probably thought a field goal was good. <laughs> yes. That would have won the game. All right, hey, I just, I just found it somehow. I found the over-under from this game, and oh. uh, the over-under was 39. So, uh, wow. it, so, so actually, this is 1919 heading into the fifth overtime. We had not hit the over yet. This is impressive. That's amazing. Uh, and the fact that 39 is a pretty low total. So I think people knew well, what they I were getting into. I think the expectations into. were that this is not going to be a shootout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're now 22-22 we're now heading into the sixth overtime. Okay. And I don't know about you, but I think it's time for them to miss some more field goals. I, I think it's time. <laughs> sixth overtime, North Texas from 57 yards. The kick is short, by the way. It's short Why from 47. Getting, getting into these positions. 57-yard field goal in overtime. For 47, 47. 47. Okay, all right, hold up, though. If your kicker can't make a 29-yarder, what's making you think, all right, hey, let's, let's try for 47. Like, let's just see how much he can really cry himself to sleep tonight. That's a good point. This is unbelievable. Yes. So they miss a 47-yarder. Florida International, a 42-yard field goal for the win in six overtime. Oh, my God. And they, they obviously they miss. Obviously. Because we're, we're still – we play on. We have one more. We play on. <laughs> So now that has now been seven missed field goals in overtime as we head into the seventh overtime. Okay, seventh overtime, Florida International, they are lining up for a 35-yard field goal. Now this is a little worrying because their kicker has kicked four field goals in overtime so far, and the only one he's made, or no, he, so he's made a 37-yarder and a 19-yarder. So he's made a 37-yarder. We know this. We know he could do it. So the 35-yard should be within his range. <laughs> should be within his range. But he misses. Of course he does. Right. He misses, which sets up the North Texas kicker with a 34-yard field goal. Come on, you can do it. The eighth field goal in this game, I think a whole – I actually – I don't know what the full count is, but it's something like the eighth field goal that would have been a game-winning field goal. And he makes it! Yay! He makes it! And North Texas wins the game 25-22 in seven overtimes. Dennis Hopovac? Dennis Hopovac <laughs> is the hero of the story. Yes, we need to track him now. Uh, after missing four field goals earlier in overtime, both, both kickers missed four field goals in overtime. Well, it's funny that you say that because um, I knew you were going to do this story. And so, uh, Dennis, are, are you there? <laughs> no, 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 he's, he's not there. No, okay, that, that would have been amazing. <laughs> I would have just left the room and just I think, gave up. I think he probably – I mean, I think he was probably the hero of the night. I think everyone's probably celebrated when he won the game. Wait, how many field goals did he? you say he missed in that game? He missed four – each kicker missed four in overtime. Because he only missed six all year. Well, that's pretty. That's interesting. <laughs> so he maybe he was a great kicker. He probably was. Dennis hurt. hurt. You know? He might be hurt. He must be hurt. hurt. He's probably hurt. You're right. If I miss four field goals in a, in a game, I am going off with like ice around, like I tape around my knee yeah. or something, and then you know on a stretcher. So what I was saying is, I think he's probably the hero of the game. But if you are the Florida international kicker, Yikes. it must be devastating. Also, I don't understand why you're not going for it from the two. I still don't get that. Yeah. Oh, and five. You're a terrible football team. Why are you kicking a 19 yard field goal to keep the misery of this game continuing? 
Yeah. I don't understand that at all. And they deserve to lose. They deserve to go 0-12 that season because mm-hmm. that's horrific. Mm-hmm. So they go 0-12. Like I said, each team misses four field goals in overtime. In seven overtimes, the overtime score finishes 9-6. to six. Right? 9-6 to six in overtime. Uh, this game was horrific. I want to talk about briefly about how terrible both of these teams were at rushing the ball. Oh, no. Uh, because Florida International finished the game with 35 rushes for 75 yards. <laughs> That's an average of 2.1 yards per carry, which makes them the better team in this Maybe game. Maybe the defenses are just so good. Because North Texas rushes the ball 55 times for 108 yards. Oh, my gosh. An average of only – I mean, it's just under 2.0. So North Florida International, so they, they rushed for 2.1 yards per carry and two, 2.0 yards per carry in this game. Uh, the game finished with 183 rushing yards and 178 penalty yards. Uh, so basically the whole rushing attack was basically Jesus. negated by penalties. Two, I'm looking at their, the 2006 Florida International statistics. Yeah, they were not good. They averaged 9.6 points a game. <laughs> That was last. <laughs> so this, so what you're telling me is, in this 22 point game, it was an offensive explosion. It was an offensive explosion. Wait, what was the North Texas um, situation? 12.8 points a game, 115th in yeah. the nation. These two teams, they went over their average. Good they were hundred, so they're 115th out of 119. What is what was was Ford International Dead last? That last? Dead last yeah, yeah. So you have two bottom five Prolific, offenses. Prolific offenses. Bottom five <laughs> offenses in the entire country. Uh, and they combined to miss eight field goals in overtime and play one of the most uh, preposterous games that's ever been played. Did you see what the next game for FIU was? Literally a week later. Oh, is this the Miami game? The Miami Brawl game. Yes. <laughs> so they go from October 7th, 2006, the, that embarrassing game that I hope to never even think about again. And then a week later, they're playing Miami, and it was actually supposed to what be – I think it was supposed to be the beginning of this, like, crosstown rivalry game. Oh, yeah. And it's the brawl. There's a guy on crutches getting attacked. There's a guy with his helmet attacking. I think they were banned from playing each other for, like, years. So an interesting two weeks there for FIU in an 0-12 season. I think they just needed to take their anger out. <laughs> Honestly, they were just so angry. Yeah, maybe anger would got going for it from the two-yard line. Yeah. Do you think that, that Roger Goodell saw this game uh, from his couch and he's like, all right, I'm never changing the NFL overtime rules? <laughs> Maybe it's Tagliabue at that point? Like, come on. Well, like, it could be. Yeah. No, yeah. I, think, I think that was Goodell's – that might have been his first year as um, – Yeah, and, they, you know, and, and, and college football doesn't see a seven-overtime game for another 11 seasons. I think everyone's fair. FIU, they've got to give them a little bit of ex- – I'm not excusing the going from the two, but they, were, they just started as a program in 02. So they're a very new team. They're a very I, new I program. So like maybe going, I mean, you can understand maybe being awful, but their coach right now is Butch Davis. Okay. Of all people. Like they're actually becoming a little bit better now than they were. But I do remember FIU at that time was just so, so bad. And I think we see that. <laughs> yeah, I think it is completely on display in this horrific football game. That's all I mean, it's just- I don't think it'll ever happen again. I mean, kicking as a whole has gotten so much better, even at these small town colleges. But I mean, come on, four missed field goals back to back to back to back. Like that's just that's ridiculous. Yeah, it's really hard to believe. Um, you know, you're expecting seven overtime games to be like eighty to seventy eight. I, I, I told you the other scores. The in the other four overtime games, uh let me pull this. Yeah, Connor, when you were going through all the scores, I was expecting you to say this game ended 152 to 158. <laughs> so, so the lowest scoring of the other seven overtime games is 58-56, right? And by the way, because uh, we talk, talked about that last week, that was a game that going into overtime was 17-17, and it yeah. finished 58-56. This game going into overtime was 16-16, only one point off, and it finished 25-22. I, I just don't even understand, like, anything. But this is what happens when you have two of the worst teams in the entire nation playing against each other in early October. Nobody cares. And once again, I'll say it one more time. You had the ball at the two-yard line and your own five, and you decide to kick it. You deserve to lose. I can't even get over that decision. I can't. <laughs> they deserve I, – I, I have no sympathy. Did that, did that coach make it anywhere? I up Can we find up the, find the coach from this team? Yeah, I just looked up his name. Okay. I, I lost it in a second. Yeah, but it was um, – here we go. 
Florida International. Yeah, we said that their team, Don Strzok. Don Strzok. He's got a solid career. He went three and seven his first year with FIU. He goes five and six the previous season, and then he goes 0 and 12. And I think that is it for him. <laughs> not coach another game after that season. That, that, that pans out. That makes sense. He had a 242 win percentage. That's good. Oh, can we look at him as a player? Hold on. It says he was a player from 70 to 72. He was a quarterback for Virginia Tech. He was selected the Dolphins in the fifth round. He won a Super Bowl? In 1972, he was ninth in the Heisman. This is exciting. So there you go. Don Strzok, a solid, maybe, NFL, at least a college player. Wow. He he, he uh, was a QB coach for the, the Ravens, and he won a Super Bowl playing for the Dolphins. That's kind of insane. He is from Pottstown, Pennsylvania, which is where I believe – no, never mind. That's Pottsville. I was going to say that's where the Yingling Brewery is, but uh, no. It's like like North guy, North. Yeah, I mean, he has solid in the NFL. He has over 5,000 passing yards, uh, 45 touchdowns, 42 interceptions. And if you think about it, if you're playing in the 70s, that was a time where people threw a million interceptions. So that's actually not that bad. I mean, he just gave up on being a coach after that because he went from being the QB coach of the Ravens to coaching the FIU. He coached for four years, and then after that 0 and 12 season, he's like, "All right, I'm 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 done." That's it. And I would be too. Yeah, it's tough, especially when you don't go from from the two. That's always tough as well. I like how though the Sun Belt. We talked about how the conference was just. I mean, you know, it's just a growing conference at the time. They finished fifth in the Sun Belt. Oh, oh my gosh. So I'm, I'm going to assume that there were only five teams that year. <laughs> uh, that is probably a good uh, assumption. And the Sun Belt now um, is is growing. There's 12 teams now yeah. in the Sun Belt. It's actually kind it's, of it's improving. This year, the Sun Belt has some solid teams in, in the conference. They have, this year. Um, they, have, they have Louisiana. Well, don't they have uh, Coastal Carolina and ranked? Coastal Carolina is currently ranked, right? And these teams were beating – Big 12 teams earlier this year, I believe. They, Coastal they were. Carolina. Um, I think they beat uh, – who beat? They someone beat, beat Kansas. Someone. I think they beat Kansas. Did they beat Kansas State? Someone beat Kansas State, who's like one of the favorites in the Big 12 right now. Uh, Louisiana beat Iowa State yeah. in week one. Louisiana beat Iowa State. Uh, and I believe Coastal Carolina ends up beating – I'm looking at this too. They beat, they beat Kansas. Kansas. That's right. But still, though, you're beating a Big 12 team, um, you know, in, in this season. So the Sun Belt, I always remember uh, thinking the Sun Belt was a complete joke. And that makes sense. They have Appalachian State in the yeah. Sun Belt now. They and they were flirting with undefeated season the last couple of years. So Georgia Southern has actually been good recently, too. So this is actually a respectable conference. 12 teams, two divisions competing with some power five teams in non-conference yeah. schedules. At I times. mean, it is, it is now. It is very different than uh, it, was. it was not in 2006. In 2006, yeah. in 2006, everyone's like the Sun Belt. You laugh and you think, oh, the Sun Belt, 0 and 12, fifth place Florida National. Who doesn't go for it from the two? But you look at the Sun Belt now, it's actually respectable. Well, real quick, I, I feel like this game is an outlier because of how exciting college football overtime is typically. Um, and I'm curious, I, I feel like I've had this conversation in bars for the last 10 years where why doesn't the NFL change their overtime rules? Um, but I'm curious on what your guys' thoughts are on it because I look at this game and, and there's just so much excitement in college football overtime. Like I said, obviously this is an outlier. But from, from your guys' perspective, how, how would you want to see NFL overtime change, if at all? Uh, I don't know what the perfect plan for overtime is. What I will say is – both teams need to be able to have the ball because there's been a lot of overtime games. But you think of the, uh, was it 2018 AFC championship with the Patriots yeah. and Chiefs? Right, right. Where it's just like whoever gets the ball is going to win the game. Mm-hmm. And there's been a lot of those kind of games where it's just the game should not be decided by the coin toss. Yeah, I think it's absolutely preposterous that a coin, a physical toss of a coin, affects maybe whether a team goes to a Super Bowl or not. I think both teams in the NFL should get a chance at scoring, at least get the ball once to at least make that a fair assessment. Or you could do what the XFL did the first season and just say, screw it, put the ball in the middle of the field and have the players run to it and wrestle for the ball. And whoever gets it, uh, that that's what happens. So, you know, this is where Jonas Gray could come in handy if he were to use <laughs> – 100-yard dash. 100-yard uh, dash it there and then use his 230-pound body to – 
get the ball. You know, but uh, I think college, the college overtime rule is perfect for college because college football is always crazy. It's always exciting. You've got wild games. I think it's a perfect atmosphere for that because who knows how it would be in college. I mean, now I think it'd be easier to score just because these offenses are better, but I just think it fits the college game perfectly. The NFL, if they, I do not think doing the college rules would work in the NFL. I think that would be very dumb. But I do think both teams should see the ball uh, at least once for the realistic chance to score because, you know, coin toss, fine. You want to start a game like that, that's great. Whoever gets the ball first, you can defer or whatever. But literally determining who might win, I mean, the Super Bowl yeah. was decided because Tom Brady was hot and they got the ball first and they scored a touchdown and that's it. And the Falcons never got a chance to score back. So I think that needs to be fixed, if anything. I would agree with that. But no, it's a great story. I mean, these overtimes – the last few years, the last couple episodes yes. of this. I'm a little upset that I can't hilarious. find more overtimes to talk about. I might try to find something, to be honest with you. Maybe you just do an investigation in like some belt football. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm not that excited <laughs> in that idea. That was really good. Our, our, our listenership viewers numbers just skyrocketing. Yes, yes. It goes the, from the more we talk about the more, the, the more, yes. I know they want to hear about the FIU story uh, in the future. So we can get Chaz to tell some good Troy stories. That's true. That's true. So we'll maybe maybe go to that in a few years. And they beat LSU a couple years ago. That's absolutely right. These Sunbelt teams, they are not to be slept on. Aha! Hey. F- fantastic, fantastic, <laughs> fantastic job. Uh, on that note, thank you, everyone, for listening to Slept On Sports. Uh, we're going to be back here every week, again, telling these lesser-known sports stories. You can follow the show on Twitter at slept underscore on underscore sports. And subscribe to the show. Give the ratings and reviews wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thanks, Mike, for being here again. Thanks, Jake, for joining the show. Uh, Anybody have any closing words? Mike, do you have any? (laughs) Yeah, since you gave us a great quote last time around, do you have any? any Sure, I'll give you something this time. (laughs) I'm very scared. I'm just looking right here. The larger the conference, the smaller the division. But the smaller the division the larger the conference. Thank you. <laughs> Have a good night, everyone. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll let you guys all, leave you all to decide for that. Percolate, yeah. Uh, but yeah, let that percolate, and we will see you next week. Thanks so much. And you guys- good-